Good morning everybody, welcome to E Thursday. I am looking forward to sharing this message with you today, talking about breaking agreements with the enemy. Um, let me just, as I get my notes up here, let me just start greeting some people who are nice and early this morning. I see Glennis Volmeron says here, welcome to you. Always good to see you. Um, I saw Monica Day was watching. Venus Vormans, Monica Day. Mona Smith, good morning. We have Maria Boven from Sweden again. Welcome to you. Um, let's have a look. Monica Day, Venus Vormans. And people aren't saying good morning. Odile Fish Stanley and Joey Grunewald, welcome to you. Um, yep. Let's see, uh, somebody else said good morning. Good morning, Joey. Um, oh, Joey, I almost added you to join me on the video by mistake by clicking on your name. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not going to go through names anymore in case I start clicking on names and you all find yourself in the video. So this morning, breaking agreements with the enemy. Um, there are th things that happen in our lives, just let me get this up properly, that um, we find ourselves in situations. Good. Let me say this. Good morning, Samantha May from Mariasburg. Wow. Um, and I saw Yandi and Kwasi is here. Welcome to you. Uh, Bridget Nicole still watch is watching. Maybe I should just wait a little while. But there are some uh, things that happen in our lives that we don't understand that without us intentionally doing anything, we've started to do what the devil wants to do, which brings us into a place where we are robbed in our faith and, and in what we trust in God to do. So today we're going to look at some of these areas. I actually have 15 points, so whether we get through them all or not, doesn't matter, we're going to start at number one because sometimes our belief systems have to be adjusted so that we can be in the place where we are secure, established in our faith with God. And um, sometimes we need them pointed out to us. Like for many years, as we just as we wait for some more people to join in, I'll start out by telling you my story. But firstly, um, Jeannie King, good morning to you. Um, you know, you can even be in ministry, you can be doing the best you know to do, but with the wrong belief system, you just sort of accept what the devil brings your way, and you think it's all spiritual and all nice, but God is a better way. And until that way of thinking is exposed, we're going to be continue to believe what we believed before. And then when something gets revealed to you by the Spirit of God, when, when the devil brings it your way, you're aware of it and you know it's like when you've been sick and suddenly you are healed or you feel better because you've taken medication or you've had surgery or something and then you feel better you realize how sick you actually were when you feel better and it's the same with these times that we come into agreement with the plans of the enemy without knowing it and once you've been set free you know it's the truth that sets us free the truth of the word that sets us free. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, Vanessa Silias, good morning, darling. Letitia Hayes, Rorden F. Van Onselen. Uh, I experienced a super breakthrough last Tuesday through your message. Vanessa, I can't even remember what last Tuesday's message was, but I'd love, I'd love to hear that kind of feedback. Michelle Cravenstein, good morning to you. Carol Ann Clarsen. Um, you know, yes, uh, Tuesday's message, Isaiah 54, I have su had such a lot of good feedback from Isaiah 54. I knew it was one of my favorite books in Isaiah, and now 
I pray it's going to be your anthem for the season, Isaiah 54, because once you find the presence of God, you can do nothing but sing and rejoice. Okay, so let's, um, let's, I'm going to get straight into this. How do we, without knowing it, work with the enemy so we get robbed? Okay, and, and as we go through these points, you will begin to recognize in your life. Hopefully, you don't have any of these, but hopefully you'll be able to recognize in your life, that's why I feel like that. That's why I do that. That's why I think that. Because this life with God is not a schizophrenic one day faith, the next day, who, who is the enemy and what's happening. We are meant to know as children of God. You know, when you live in a family uh, uh, with a father who is stable and secure and doing what he's supposed to do, um, you, there's a sense of security. And so when you're in trouble, you know where to go to. And when things go wrong, you know who to blame. So that's, this is where we're going today. So my first scripture to you is 1 John 3 verse 8 that says, For this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. So just that one scripture tells me that any work of the evil one has already been dealt with. And you know this, we have authority in Christ. So any work that comes from the evil one um, should not be able to come and overwhelm us, overtake us, pursue us, and all of these things. We shouldn't be living in this place. And now, Rory and myself know a lot of people over the years of ministering to people in, in, in ministry, and even though we don't pastor a church, we still deal with people. And there are certain people who have a syndrome on them that nothing ever changes. It gets goes from bad to worse, and they live in this place of, what is going on in my life? I feel like I'm cursed. And then they go for ministry and get prayed for, get deliverance, and they repent for the rest of their lives. But th things just do not change. And I believe it's a huge part. Every, every case is different. But I believe a huge part that gives the enemy inroads is a belief system. So, because it comes out of their mouths, in, in some form, they say something, and then you think, ah, oh, that's the belief system. It's what do you expect? It's who do you see God in your life, and who do you know you are in Christ, or do you even know? So here's the first one. And then some of them are very simple, but I believe if you really think about it, and you take note today, it's going to change something about your belief system. So number one, the, the reason I'm bringing this one up is... Um, it, it comes out of the mouth of so many people who have who struggle with condemnation. And um, they struggle with identity issues and they always feel that, that they can't, they never measure up. So the first one is when you think God wants to point out your mistakes all the time. It's like God is watching you from heaven and he's, he knows your failures, he knows your mistakes. And he wants to remind you all the time. Now, in our minds, we know we are forgiven. But in our hearts, do we really believe that God looks at us in spite of our attitudes and our mistakes and our failures and our regrets and our weaknesses? And we have to believe that that's how he looks at us in Christ. So Hebrews 4 says this. Hebrews 4 verse 16 is the antidote to this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that scripture in the Bible is not there just to fill a gap. That scripture is in there so that when we feel that we need help, we don't have to go to God and grovel and first repent of, you know, say 20 Hail Marys and then repent of everything we've ever done before God will even pay us attention. God looks at us in Christ. Even in the Old Testament, it's in Isaiah 1.18, the Old Testament says this, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So, Old Testament and New Testament here, we have access to come boldly to the throne of grace. So, the next time you want to go and pray, and the devil says to you, yeah, but you first need to get your life right before you can speak to God. Just shrug that thing off. 
<laughs> you know, we do have to live a righteous life. We, we are righteous in Christ. We have to live a righteous life. But don't let the, the belief system that you, you aren't good enough to come to God to ask him for help. He's your dad. He's your father. He's a holy God. And you are, you are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, my relationship with my earthly father was a good one. Um, I was, when he was alive, I was his only daughter. I am the only girl in the family with three brothers. And my father, I knew I had a security, a sense of love and acceptance. And I knew he was proud of me. And I never had to do anything to get his attention. And it wasn't just because I was the only daughter, but I never had the sense. But there are a lot of people who never had a good, healthy relationship with their father. So, so they bring that into the relationship with their earthly father. And they feel they have to earn some earn approval or get attention by doing things. And so we can't bring that into our relationship with our Heavenly Father when we have all of these scriptures and He says, you're accepted in the Beloved. You are, you are my Beloved. And, and you find the scriptures about how God sees you. And that will shatter that, that idea of sitting before God and saying, you know, I've, I've got to repent of these things first. Unless the Spirit of God is really heavy on you saying, go and repent, then do it. But, but if the Spirit of God is not, go boldly into the throne of grace. You know, every day there's something we have to repent of, I'm sure, um, unless that's just me. Um, and it's attitudes. I remember once sitting with God, and, and I really wanted to have a nice conversation with God many years ago. But I, I had the sense that I first had to clean myself up. And then this is the picture that I got. It's like every time I, I want to speak to Rory, my husband, um, do I first have to tell him about all my attitudes and the things I haven't done and the things I have done before we can have a conversation? It would be terrible. Imagine if your husband had to come to you every day and before you could sit down and have your first coffee in the morning, he had to you know, sort out his attitudes and everything. It would be quite a, a difficult relationship. So don't bring that into God. Just come boldly into the throne of grace. Number two, and this is a big one. This is how we work with the enemy without even realizing it. We become passive in our faith. And, and it happens to every single one of us because God speaks. And then we think, okay, God spoke. I've got faith. And then we wait. And so religion tells, tells us, religion, because, you know, religion becomes a set, it is a set of rules that you have to live by so you can meet the standards. Now, we don't live according to religion. Aren't you glad about that? We live in relationship because of Christ. But religion tells us that God does everything because he's sovereign. So we don't have to do anything but wait and trust. And have faith. Yes, it all sounds right, but we don't have to do anything. And I saw a meme the other day, uh, not a meme, a little a graphic, an image, um, of a lady holding up a placard. I must find it. And, and the words on the placard said something like this. And I probably got it wrong. Um, oh, It was about David and Goliath. David, you can pray as much as you like. But David had to pick up that stone to kill Goliath. And so what we do is we fall into the trap of being passive because God is in control. We use those things. God's got this. God's in control. God knows what, God knows what he's doing. But we can say that without doing what he's told us to do, to operate in authority. So David could have run out there on the battlefield, looked at Goliath and said, God's got this. God's with me. But only when he got that stone out and you know, his sling stone, slingshot and his stone, that's what dealt with Goliath. His cooperating, knowing God was with him. So I said this on Tuesday that I really feel we need to recognize the hour of urgency as the body of Christ, that there are things we need to rise up against. We need to stand in authority and we need to be praying prayers um, of, of authority so that the plans of the enemy can be stopped. Because when we believe that to wait on God means we do nothing, 
then we're going to be waiting and waiting and the enemy just comes in and occupies the territory that God has promised the church. So waiting on God doesn't mean sitting around doing nothing. It means sitting on the edge of your seat. It's a posture of expectation. I'm waiting on God because I'm in preparation for what he's going to do. That's waiting. And if we become passive, are you all still there? If we become passive, then we stop dreaming. We stop, you know, all those great dreams that you had. And because you've waited so long without doing the doing that has to go with the waiting, you stop dreaming. And when you stop dreaming with God, you lose vision. And then there's no need to have faith. So this is what we, what we need to do to overcome becoming passive is we get a scripture, we get the promises. I said this to you on Tuesday, get out your promises, begin to declare them. So we get a scripture, we stay there and we decree it and we pray it until it comes to pass. Because God didn't just give you that promise and he didn't just give you that prophecy or that scripture so you could feel good. It's actually raining in Cape Town. How amazing is that? I think the weather forecast did say rain, but I sound a little bit surprised. So we camp there and we stay there until it manifests. Now, I'm in this place where I need to see miracles. I need to see healing. And I've spoken to so many believers lately who are going through physical challenges. And I don't want to get to the place where we just become passive and we say, oh, well, one day. No, I have the sense of urgency that... We have to be laboring in prayer. We have to be, be pursuing the promises of God and his intentions for this season, not five years from now, this season. We need to see the body of Christ rising up and walking in authority. And it's not going to happen if we become passive and we say, God knows, God's got this. No, he's got it, but he wants us with him on the journey. So in the book of Colossians chapter 4, there's a scripture that says in verse 2, uh, Paul writing to the Colossians, he says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So are we really continuing earnestly in prayer? And I'm not giving you a whole lot of works that you must do, because the very next point is about faith not being performance. But we need to be doing something in cooperation with the leading of the Spirit of God, so that we do not fall into the trap of being passive. That's what religion wants you to do. You know, think of all the people who are not born again. You go to church week after week and they feel good because they've shown their face in church. And they're, they're actually passive Christians. Uh, yeah, passive uh, Christians. God-fearing people, sincere people, but they've fallen into the trap of religion. that just keeps them passive because they never get taught about the authority they have. Now, you and I know about the authority we have. So let's not be passive in our faith. So also in Colossians 4 and verse 12, it talks about a guy by the name of Ep 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 Epiphras. I think that's how you say it. And it says here, always, this is what this guy did. He always is laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. And that word laboring is speaking about giving birth. So here's a guy who was physically, not physically, why did I say physically, literally giving birth in his prayers for the people he was ministering to. Now, when God has given you a promise and you know God has spoken to you and you can't see it happen, are you going to sit back and say, oh, well, it's not the right time? Or Because even if it's not the right time, we still have things to do until the right time, until the due season. So are we laboring fervently in our prayers? And you don't have to go out there and tell everybody about it. You do it behind closed doors. It's you and God. And you give birth to things in prayer because we refuse to be passive. Okay. Number three, one big way that we begin to work with the enemy and we end up getting robbed is when we think that faith is performance. So in the old covenant, there were consequences there were blessings and consequences. If you obey God, there's the blessing. If you disobey God, there's the consequence or the curse. So in the Old Testament, it was like, if you did this, then God will do this. We do not live. If, if you do this, God will do this. There are consequences of obedience, yes. When the Holy Spirit instructs you to do something, you obey that, you're going to receive the, the, the blessings of that. 
Also, if you disobey something, there are going to be consequences, but your faith life is not a life of performance to get God to do something. In the Old Testament, it even says this in Isaiah 1.19. It says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And so we read that and we think, oh, well, I've got to bring this into my life today. Then maybe the reason I'm not eating the good of the land or seeing the blessing is because God looks at me and I'm not willing and obedient. You have to change your thinking. You're not living under the old covenant anymore. So today we don't live out of what we can do to please God. We live out of what Jesus has already done. So there's a big difference here. So um, we receive by grace what, what Jesus paid for. And we live in that. And we say we are willing and obedient because we love God. But our eating the good of the land, the blessing comes because we have chosen to receive by faith. We receive, we live by grace and not by how much we can do. And so a lot of people do things uh, by faith. They say, I'm doing it by faith and it's, I can do this. And it ends up becoming performance and they expect God to, to do things in return because they performed. God doesn't tip us when we do something well. He doesn't give us pocket money when we do what we're meant to do, when we do all our daily Christian chores, and then we get some pocket money. No, God wants to bless us over and above. He wants to do more than we can even ask or think because of what Jesus has done. So get that performance mode out of your belief system. That, you know, because if we believe that, then we're going to look at other people who seem more blessed than us, and we're going to try and do what they do, to get more blessing and it's not that way you have to live by grace in the finished work of Christ that's where our blessing comes from and it's a, you know there's so many scriptures that say only believe um, I wish I had them here but I don't have them now only believe all we have to do is believe that Jesus paid the price and our faith is is developed out of that place and so when you do things out of fear or habit um, example, um, we do things out of fear, in other words, praying. Um, so we keep up that performance and we think if we stop doing that, then God can't bless us. If we stop declaring the word, you know, it becomes a habit sometimes to get out the promise box and, and declare the scriptures. And if we do things out of habit instead of out of grace and faith, then we end up living in fear and we think that God can't bless us. And so I remember um, not so long ago, God spoke to me. Um, I did share this. I think that, that I know there's a lot of spiritual activity when I get, um, I start having these weird dreams and I find myself binding the devil in my dreams, all kinds of things. And so for a few nights in a row, I was getting into bed and I was saying, Lord, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. And it wasn't out of fear. I was just speaking the word over my dream life. And then one night I didn't do that. And I woke up in the middle of the night and the first thought that hit me was, oh, you, didn't, you didn't pray that prayer. And I thought, that's not God, that's the devil. <laughs> and I just shrugged that thing off and I had a fantastic night's sleep. Do not get caught in the trap of feeling that you have to do something thinking it's faith, but it's actually performance. Faith is responding to what the Holy Spirit shows you to do. So take a deep breath, shrug off that performance mode that maybe you might find yourself in, and say, God, I want to live by grace, because it's, faith is freedom in Christ. And you know when you meet people, and they're saying the right stuff, and, but you know it's all done, you know, even praying for your children, you can, you can do it in obedience, but you can also do it out of faith, fear instead of faith. So you pray these desperate prayers over your family and over your children. You pray these desperate prayers over your business because you think it's faith. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you're praying something because of fear, it's good to pray when you fear. We have to pray. We go to God. We say, God, help us with this. But then we say, God, you didn't give me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of sound mind. So I'm not going to perform here and do something out of fear. I need to do it by faith. And then we say, God, speak to me. So I'm doing it by faith. There's a big difference. Fear or faith. And that God did not give us a spirit of fear was 2 Timothy 1, 7, I think. 
Okay, the next one is living in warfare mode instead of victory mode. We've got to get this out of our brains. Warfare without God's help is a lot of hard work. It's heavy labor and toil. Warfare, where all you do is you focused on the battle out there in your home, in your mind. There's a big battle going on. There's always a battle going on. But if that is your focus, you're not going to be a very joyful Christian. You're not going to be free enough to hear what God wants to say in the middle of a battle because you're so busy in this warfare mode instead of being in victory mode. So warfare without God's help is hard work. But victory is when your posture is, here I am, God. I'm waiting for your leading. And then we do what he tells us to do because God always sees things from our victory point of view because he sees the end from the beginning. He has the answer. He has the solution. So when we live in victory mode and we say, God, I'm not, I know the battle is there. You know, you are aware when there's a battle going on in your life and you know how to pray. You got the scriptures, you know how to declare the word, but don't always be looking for a battle that, that isn't yours to fight. To, you know, live with the idea of how big God is instead of how big the battle is. That's so we're going to look at that just now. So, when we live in victory mode, we get up in the morning and it's God, today is a day of victory. I don't care what the enemy says. I don't care what I see. I don't care what my needs are. I'm coming to you because you are bigger. I want to be in victory mode. And then we say, I'm going to live today in response to you because when I do that, the victory is unlocked and it begins to manifest here in our lives. And we first get the breakthrough or the victory on the inside before it manifests in the natural so if you're living in warfare mode, you're going to have this battle going on inside of you because you can't do it on your own. And you're going to be struggling and striving to get God to speak to you. So maybe in your business, let's just use this as an example, in your business or your family, you need to see some breakthrough. You need to see the victory of God. You need to see the promises come to pass. Get your focus off the battle and onto God and say, God, what are you saying in this situation? And you find you have an adjustment. You become a person who has more joy because you brought God into this thing that you're going through. And then he releases keys and he gives you scriptures and he raises up people to pray. He probably has already, but you've been so focused on the battle that you don't even think anybody's thinking of you. And then all these other rejection, feeling forgotten, victim mentality things come along and add to the battle. So stop in your tracks and say, God, I don't want to live in a battle mode all, all the time. I want to be able to focus on you so I can hear the victory that you have in store for me. God always has a way out and a way through, and he wants to unlock victory for you. I just want to stop right now and pray for people right now for that area. So Lord, if, if it's you, just receive this. Lord, I thank you that you are a God of victory, that um, on Tuesday afternoon you said that the gates of victory are already open in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray for your people who are trusting you for breakthrough, who are trusting you, especially in the area of finance and business in this season, and also for family issues. And I pray, Lord, that we would get our, our eyes off the warfare and fixed on you, the author and finisher of our faith. I thank you, Father, that warfare with you is not a whole lot of toil, but the breakthrough comes, the answers come. And so, Lord, I pray for those people for peace to come on the inside for the breakthrough to manifest on, in their spirit man, that they'll rise up and they'll say, I'm going to unlock the victory here on earth in my business and my family and whatever other areas you need to see the victory come. It's time to see the miracles. You have to agree with me. Here's a declaration that you can agree with me. It's time to see the miracles of God in, in finance, in, in provision, in business, in um, healing, and miracles. It's time to see the miracles of God. So if you agree with me, that's what I need you to be declaring today. And, and you expect it when you begin to get out of warfare mode and you see that this life in Christ, this abundant life in Christ, there is opposition. But we have authority. See, here's number five. Let's see if we get through all of this today. Number five is another big one that will keep you trapped by the enemy if you don't change this way of thinking. Not knowing his will. We say, God, I don't know your will for my life. I, how can I pray? I don't know what to do. How am I ever going to find victory? 
if we don't know his will. And we say, but I can't hear from God. Everybody else seems to hear from God. But there's a scripture in Matthew 6 where Jesus said, told the disciples to pray this way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if you want to know God's will, just stop and think about it. Read the scriptures. What is his will in heaven? And stick to the New Testament scriptures. God's will has to be an understanding, a revelation that comes to you. That God's will for your life, for your family, for your business, for your body, for your bank account is always good. God wants to give you your desires. A lot of people are so scared to trust God for something or to even step out by faith because God has said, because we don't want to miss him. So we say, I don't want to be out of God's will, so we never do anything and we wait for 20 years until God gives us a, you know, a kick in the bum and then we do it. Some people are too scared to get up and prophesy to somebody because they don't want to be out of his will or make a mistake. I want to just set your heart at rest now. If, you're, if you are sincere before God and you're obeying something you feel he's told you to do, if he doesn't want you to do it, his no is loud enough to get you to stop doing it. He's a kind father. He wants you to be in his will more than you want to be in his will. And he knows how to close doors and open doors. And I think he actually likes it when we say, God, this is what I feel you want me to ask you or to do or to believe for or to step out and try. I think he likes it when we do that because when we, if we're really going to get out of his will, he closes that door so fast because he knows if we're out of his will, we open to what the enemy can, can do to us. And so we need to be people who we say, God, we know your will is good. Your will is always the best way. And I want to do it your way. And we need to believe that God wants to lead us. That's, a, that's an important part. He is leading you right now. Unless you've got a hard heart and you're stubborn and obstinate and rebellious and you say, no, I want to do it my way. As a child of God, He is leading you. Whether you're doing nothing or you're doing a whole lot, God is involved in your life because you've asked Him to be. So we become these people who prophesy from heaven. We say, God, your will is good. So when, when He said, pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we prophesy His will here into our families, into our bodies, into our bank accounts and businesses. We prophesy His will and it's declaring that He is good and He is leading us and He knows we need to be in His perfect will. Okay, so remember that. Number six, if whatever you do for God, you step out, you go on a ministry trip, you minister to somebody in the mall or whatever you do, do never ever have, Rory and I call this backlash, backlash. There are people who live expecting backlash from the enemy whenever they do something for God. And I can explain it this way, that... Um, People think that if they pray and they have an amazing time of intercession and people get healed or they go and minister in Brazil or Japan or somewhere and people get saved all over the place, that they expect the enemy to come and retaliate because they've done something with God. Never, ever, ever have I entertained that and never, ever, ever have I seen that kind of thing happen. Because we don't expect that in our lives. We expect that when we do something for God, He is with us. His glory is our real God. He goes before us. His angels encamp around about us. He protects us. He's the glory in our midst and He's a wall of fire around us. Here's a New Testament, Matthew 28, 18. And this is in the 18 and 19, in the Amplified Version. When Jesus was giving the disciples the commission to go out, He said to them, Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, in other words, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And in verse 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, Jesus himself said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Every area is covered. Now you go and do this. He gave them the authority he had to go and do this. And so they never went anywhere. I believe they wouldn't have gone anywhere and think, oh, we're going to cast out some demons now. Now we better get run and hide away for two weeks because those 
the devil's going to come and, and attack us now because of what we've done. The devil always wants to attack you. We know this. The devil always wants to stop you. But just because you did something for God, don't expect that worse is going to happen to you. Also, we know people who they would go on ministry trips and then they would be uh, getting people to pray for their family back at home and every connection that they had because they were going to do something for God. And it, this comes out of a fear. When you do something for God, you go in the absolute grace and the anointing that destroys every yoke of, a, of bondage and oppression. So you go there believing you're anointed, you're called to do something. God would never, you know, if you had a child, you send your son out somewhere and you say, I want you to go and represent our family and just go and, you know, go and visit this, these people over here and take them something and be nice to them. And then, and then say to him, well, you must just be careful that because you went out and you represented our family, you're going to be attacked on the way home. That doesn't happen. But why do we believe this in our, in our ministries and in our walk with God? You are covered. You're covered. Okay, number seven. When we expect everyone to be against us all the time because we're doing the will of God, there's this thing that sits on prophetic people who don't have an understanding is that if you go somewhere, even to the body of Christ, and you prophesy, that people are going to come against you. You know, that's Old Testament thinking. Jesus himself said, a prophet is without honor in his own town. But, and that, that is true. But it doesn't mean people are going to accuse you. It just means people are, they're not, they're not really going to hear what you have to say. And that's a whole message on its own. But um, because you prophesying, should mean in the Old Testament that the prophets were sent to rebellious people who didn't want to hear the word of the Lord, and that's why they opposed them. So, but not in the New Testament, unless you're going there and causing a whole lot of trouble, then you, it's going to be your own fault that people are against you. But when you go and God sends you to His own people, to the body of Christ, and you prophesy the heart of God to them, they're going to accept you and receive the word of the Lord. But there are, there's this syndrome on prophetic people. People, It's a horrible place to be. It's a difficult calling to have because people don't receive it. No, it's, there's grace on your life to prophesy the heart of God to people. So don't expect people to be against you all the time because you're doing the word of God. So this happens when we forget that we have the favor of God on our lives. So the favor of God is amazing because it turns hearts around. Um, you... The, even when there are people against you, God can even turn that thing around. The Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Isn't that amazing? And it's not that they're going to invite you out for tea and cake. and They're, they're going to have nothing bad to say about you. They're just going to let you go. Even your enemies, when your ways please the Lord, God does that for you. So don't live with this expectation that, Oh, everybody's against me all the time. And then you get a rejection syndrome. You get this, you know, I may as well go and live in a cave. And, and I'll come down and do something for God every now and again. But I'm expecting the backlash. Or I'm expecting people to be against me. Because I'm speaking on behalf of God. No, we're called to live in unity. We're called to do what we're called to do. And to encourage and support each other all the time. If people are against you, maybe it's because they're jealous of something. And they're the ones who have the problem. It's not because you're doing the will of God. So let them go. Pray for people who are against you. Be a blessing. Forgive people. Smile, breathe, and wave. And do what God tells you to do, knowing you are surrounded by the favor of God. Okay, here's another one. Um, I don't... I've got quite a big one here that maybe I should... I'll do this one quickly. When you step outside your scope of practice... In other words, when you try to find a position that you weren't called to fit, when you're trying to do something that God hasn't called you to do, in other words, your scope of practice in the natural realm, in any business realm, is what are you qualified to do? And you stay within those parameters, those boundaries. You, your practice is this much, and that's it. And if anybody else needs more help or advice, you refer them to someone who's more experienced than you. That's what happens in the natural realm. A, a physiotherapist can do so much, but if they have to refer you to, so, to someone who knows more than them, a doctor, 
then they'll refer you to the doctor who has more experience in a certain area that you may need help in. So if the physio is trying to do everything that the doctor does, they actually are overstepping their boundaries and they won't do the job properly and somebody can be injured even more than they have been. So we need to understand our scope of practice in the, net, in the spiritual realm. What has God called you to do? Has he called you to be uh, an intercessor in the season? And if, you, if that's all you do, you're staying in your scope of practice. But some people hear what God says to do, gives them to do, and they do it. And then they want to step out and go and preach the word and, and prophesy to people when God hasn't said that. And then you're trying to find a position you were called to fit. And you know how the enemy robs you in that area? You get burnt out. You get rejected by people because they can see that this is not what you're called to do. There's not that favor on your life that you need to accomplish what God wants to do, to do because he's chosen someone else. And he said to you, all I want you to do in this season is intercede. And that's where you find the blessing and the grace and the revelation that comes because you're doing only what God has called you to do. There are people who call themselves apostles and they haven't even, they haven't done the, you know, been through the process of becoming an apostle. Maybe they planted one or two churches somewhere and now they are calling themselves apostles. Be very careful of the labels you put on yourself and only do what God has given you to do. Because once you overstep the boundaries, there's a whole lot of authority issues that come into play. If you don't have the authority to be a prophet or an apostle, you, you're going to be sprouting a whole lot of words and doing a whole lot of things out there, but it's not going to be doing what is needed to be done because somebody else was called to do that. A lot of people do, um, they see people preaching and then they think, oh, I can do that, but they weren't called to do that. They don't understand that the people who are doing what, the, most of the people who are doing what they're called to do have been called to do it. So there's a grace that comes to do that. And then God works through those people. And then if you don't have that grace, you try and do it. And you see, God is so kind to his people, so people will get healed and they'll get a nice message. But, but the, for the person who's stepped out of their scope of practice, they'll end up getting tired, burnt out. Then the enemy comes with backlash and all kinds of things because the grace is what keeps you in that place God has called you to operate in. Very important to understand that. So don't step out. But if God says to you, go and preach at this meeting, go and uh, write this song, you know, do whatever it may be, start a business, then you'll find that there's a grace on you to do it. And even when the opposition comes, you have the authority because you have the backing of heaven because you're doing what God said you need to do. That's what true authority is. When you can stand in authority knowing you have the backing of heaven because you obeyed what God told you to do. Okay, that one I've added. Let's get this. I've got to get bring this one in. I have to. I have to. It's believing. This one sets us up for distraction. This one sets us up for a whole lot of discouragement and confusion. We get robbed of our faith when we believe that God intentionally allows hardships to shape us. You, I think you've heard me speak about this. You would have heard Rory speak about it, this because it's one of our, our worst cases of wrong belief systems that people live in. And it sounds so spiritual because some people even believe that the more difficult the challenges that you go through, the greater the calling that you have. And so, yes, there will be challenges. But the greater the calling that you have, the greater the grace you have to fulfill the calling. So when people believe that God intentionally allows you to go through hardships to make you a better person, then you may as well believe that God has favorites or he's schizophrenic. One day he wants to bless you, the next day he's got to try you out. The next day he wants to keep you from something, the next day he wants to overload you with benefits. No, God is the same, he's constant. He's good and he does not allow hardships in our lives. That word allow is a dangerous one because we use that if we don't understand it. And because we say God is sovereign, so he allows it. And then when we believe that, we forget that he gave us authority over the enemy. I just read you that thing, Jesus, in Matthew 28. I, I have been given authority. So we walk in that authority. So... If you believe that God allows things in your life, 
How do you pray in faith if you never know? Is it God? Is it the devil? We lived in this place for so long. Is do do I go to God when the word says, "Come boldly to the throne of grace"? Do I bind the devil or do I just sit back and be passive because God's allowing it? So you can't pray in faith if you believe God allows things in your life. I don't know, you know, when if you don't believe, if you believe that God wants somebody sick so they can learn to have faith, how are you going to pray for that person? You may as well say, well, if God's allowed it, I can't pray against God. It's, it's a ridiculous way of thinking, but we accept it as being spiritual because God is sovereign. So we need to know who the enemy is. You know, you know in the book of James, this is, a, this is a very confusing thing because in James, it says, James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And then it speaks about the testing of your faith produces patience. So we think, oh, well, God is testing my faith so he can produce this great patience in my life. But that scripture is actually saying when you fall into a trial, you find yourself in a battle, you find yourself in a difficult, difficult situation, take charge over your joy, be the commander over your joy. That's what counted all joy means. So we take charge over our joy because we know we have authority in this situation. And even though our, our faith is being tested, it's producing patience. It produces patience. Because in verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So when that scripture there used to bring me a whole lot of condemnation because I used to, when I was in a battle and I would go to God and it's like, I can't, I don't know which way to go. Is this God? Is this the devil? I don't know what to do. And then it says, but if I don't ask in faith, I'm going to be like somebody who's got two minds because double-minded means having no focus. And only when they had the, I had the revelation of the goodness of God could I read that scripture through a different lens because God was saying, you find yourself in a trial, take charge of your joy because I know what to do in this. And your answer in the trial is not to sit back and say, God, you're allowing this in my life so I can learn to be patient and have perseverance and great faith and all of this stuff. Um, it's come to me because I can give you the wisdom and with your joy and my wisdom, you're going to get through this. But don't be double-minded. Don't say, is this God or is this the devil? You know it's the devil because God is good. And so I hope this makes sense to you because we, we, we are not double-minded when we focused on God because here he gives us the key. Come to me and ask me for wisdom. So when you're in a trial and you believe it's God allowing it, you're going to do nothing about it. And then you're going to say, oh, God's allowing it. And one day when I have enough patience or he sees that I have enough faith, then he'll answer my prayer. No, he wants you to rise up now in the middle of the trial and come against that thing with his wisdom. Because God is interested in our character, and it's our character that grows when we are in a trial. It's not your great faith. You become a better person. Your, your spiritual maturity is what God is interested in. And so your spiritual maturity increases when you say, go to God and you say, God, I'm asking you for wisdom. That's maturity. It's not, I'm going to sit back and do nothing. Absolutely nothing happens. Nothing grows. You don't get any more patience by waiting. You actually have to engage with God. So I hope that made sense for somebody here today. Um, we've got a few more to go and then we can end. Um, number nine. And uh, no, it's not number nine anymore because I've skipped a few things here and there. But when you don't mourn the loss and disappointments in your life, you set yourself up for, for discouragement and confusion. You have to mourn the loss and disappointments to get God's help. Instead of living in denial and you say, yes, you know, I know this happened. I know I lost somebody during COVID. I know I'm having a struggle in my business or I need God to heal me. But we don't mourn those things. We become spiritual and we say, I can do this. I've got faith to do this. I know God is with me. So Isaiah 61 says to console those who mourn in Zion. He wants to console you. But unless you come to him and you say, I need your help. Uh, I need to be consoled. I need some comfort. He can't give it to you. He can't give you the oil of joy unless you go to him and you take your sorrows to him. That's an important one. Don't be super spiritual and say, I can do this. 
I'm a man or a woman of faith. I know God has, has heard me. There are emotions we have as people here on the earth. There are things we go through that we need to take to him. Just like a father. Do not live in denial. You're allowed to go to God and say, God, this is how I feel. I feel sad today. I feel discouraged today. I don't know what, what I'm going to do about the situation. And then as we do that with him and we're real and vulnerable, he gives us beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. Okay? Uh, I'll give you this one quickly. By magnifying the problem instead of God. Psalm 34 says, Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. When we make the problem bigger than God, it's so easy to do that. We see the problems, we make the problem bigger than God, and then we actually have magnified the problem. And you know, you take a magnifying glass, and you will find all the flaws and the weaknesses, you'll find more problems than that you ever even than you even were aware of in the first case. And all you do is you get back into that battle mode instead of the victory mode, warfare mode instead of victory mode. And so God said to me one day, standing in a meeting, if you've read what in one of my books, I think it's Wait, Pray, Listen, God said to me, I give you permission to supersize me. And I thought, what on earth does this mean, supersize me? And I thought of the scripture, magnify the Lord for he is worthy to be praised. It's like, make God bigger than the problem, because he is bigger than the problem. And if we continually magnify the problem, you know how we do it? We talk about the problem all the time. We go to bed, we think about the problem all the time. Instead of bringing God into it and saying, God, you are bigger than this thing. When we magnify him, he steps in and he's able to give us the answers. Um, I think it's 20 past 10. I've got one, two, three, four. Uh, are you still willing to hang around a little bit longer? I'll do it quickly and then we can finish soon. Um, the next thing that happens that will rob us is to become accusing people. You know, we think of, we. some people have a picture of the devil up in heaven with God accusing you all the time. Having a conversation with God about your life. And that comes out of the book of Job. An old picture, Old Testament picture of Satan going to God and saying, you know, I've been walking back and forth on the earth. And they have this whole conversation. In the New Testament, the devil is not even allowed into the presence of God to stand before God and to have a discussion about you. God doesn't want to have a discussion with the devil about you. God looks at you in Christ, covered by the blood, redeemed, restored, potential, purpose, destiny, breakthrough, favor on your life, an anointing that deals with the plans of the enemy. The, the devil is not able to accuse you before God. But what happens is, because the devil can't go to God, the devil uses people to accuse you. And so we must be careful that we don't become the accuser of the brethren ourselves. There is no longer an accuser of the brethren in the name of Satan. But, but when we begin to speak about other people, when we begin to judge and criticize other people, we take on the job of the accuser. And when we talk about other people and we say, they shouldn't have done that, they should have done it another way, we start discussing other people, it releases a whole lot of demonic assignments over those people. And they wonder, why do I feel so heavy? Why do I this and that? Because the accuser of the brethren has been accusing them in the realm of the spirit. So make sure the words that you release over people are words of blessing, words of encouragement, and if you, if you think this, they're doing something wrong, rather take it to God. Take it to the best place, the best person, and that's God. Instead of discussing it. And then, then we're speaking freedom over each other. We're speaking life and, and potential over people. And God always wants us. I really believe this. This is one, one of the foundational things in the ministry God has given me, is to call out the gold in people. And even when, when you feel at your lowest, God sees your best in Christ. When you feel that there's nothing more that you can do, God sees the potential and, and, and the purpose on your life. And so if we are going to be people like that, then we are going to see the best in people. And I always think this, when I see somebody in, when I sit next to someone in church, or I speak to believers wherever I am, and even unbelievers, but and I, I want to treat everybody as though they are the most important person to God, because they actually are. 
And I never want to be a person who looks down on other people because, you know, you haven't been a Christian for as long as me, as I have. And, you know, we have these attitudes every, every now and again. If we can learn to treat each other the way God would treat us, how good would life be? <laughs> so let's start at home. Serving one another. Seeing seeing the potential. You could be sitting next door, uh, sitting right next to the person whose God is raising up to be the leader of a next generation could be your children in your own home. And how are you speaking to your kids so that when they grow up, they, they believe, wow, this is how God sees me. I've, I've got some gold in my life, the glory of God that God wants to release. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, how are we doing for time? I see you. most of you are still here. Okay. When we continue to have unbelief about our identity in Christ, we set ourselves up to be robbed. If you refuse to believe that God sees you in Christ, that you're accepted, that you're forgiven, that you are the redeemed of the Lord, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Every day, you say, I am the redeemed of the Lord. You've got to be saying it. So don't continue to have unbelief about your identity. Advance, break up the camp, leave the ashes of the campfire behind. Change the song you're singing. You are the redeemed of the Lord, accepted in the beloved. You are the great company that God has in this day and in this age. I've got two more. Blaming God for everything bad that happens. Saying that he's sovereign, he knows, so he must have allowed this. I think I covered that enough. Don't You know, the world blames God for every bad thing that happens, natural disasters. There was a thing on insurance forms a couple of years ago. I don't know if it exists because they've taken God out of everything, but maybe they've left him in this case. Um, God, oh, what's it called? An act of God. So when something happens, you can get a claim against it. An act of God. So everything gets blamed on God, the bad things. But they don't remember him when the good things happen. So don't blame God for every bad thing. There are reasons why bad things happen. And a lot of the time it's our mistakes our lack of faith, our lack of walking in authority. I don't know. I can't answer all of those questions because I know some people went through some really tough times. And I can't say it was their lack of faith or what happened. I don't have the answers. But we cannot blame God for everything bad that happens. And here's the last one. Being unforgiving is a huge trap of the enemy. Matthew 18 tells us if we are unforgiving, we get handed over to the torturers. We don't want to be, I know what it's like. I was unforgiving um, um, towards somebody who did something to one of my family members many, many years ago. And and even the family member who was the one who, who had everything happen to him, I took it all on myself. I had sleepless nights. I had I felt like I had been drinking poison because that's what unforgiveness does. And unless we get to a place where we can say, God, I need your help. I forgive this person. It's a, a choice I make now. I don't feel as if I'm forgiving them, but I choose to forgive because of your word. And I got released of this feeling as if I had been tortured all the time because you can't do anything about being unforgiven. And then 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11 says this, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So in this day and age, and I think this is a good one to end on, in this day and age when there's so much rubbish on social media, so much accusation, so much opposition, and even coming from the world as well, the church being accused of all kinds of things, do not take on that unforgiving thing. Be people who are quick to forgive and to release so that we remain in the freedom of God. Christ, because the devil has a de is divisive, and the devil has ways and means to get you in there and to get you to focus on this person said this about you, this person behind your back, and a lot of the time there's miscommunication, and we hear these reports coming from everywhere, and it's all seed that the enemy's sowing everywhere. So God's people will begin to walk in unforgiveness before we even realize it. We've stepped into unforgiveness, and and Rory and I had a case where. There were uh, people were saying things about us, and there were false accusations that really got like we've had this over the years that people accused us of things that we didn't even know at the time, and then they, they didn't speak to us about it for a long time. 
And then it came out somewhere along the line. And unless those things are spoken and, and released and we say we forgive you, or the person acknowledges what they did, and you, and you have an opportunity to forgive, there are all of these things that are going around. So right now, I, I can tell you without hesitation, there are probably people who think that you've done things that you've never done, or you've said things that you've never said, and they haven't spoken to you about it. But, so if you go and look for it, you're going to find those things out. But it's safer to just be constantly forgiving. Forgive those people. If you think someone has a problem with you and they see you at the mall and they walk on the other side and they don't greet you, don't harbor unforgiveness or mistrust or resentment because it opens the door for the devil to rob you. So I'm going to end with that this morning. And I want to thank you so much for hanging out with me for so long. It was an an hour. And for hanging out and for listening to all of this. And, and I want you to be free and to enjoy life with God. With all your the, the sorrows and the battles and the, you know, just make sure that you know that God wants to lead you. That God is good. He doesn't have a hand in sending destruction your way or loss your way. He's not blaming you for anything He's not looking at you finding fault. He's saying, come to me, come boldly to my throne of grace because he wants to lead you. He wants to show you his goodness. He has already given you the way out. He's given you favor. And the calling on your life is still there no matter what you've been going through. Your business is going to thrive. There are promises. The wealth of the, the wicked will be handed over to the righteous. There's scriptures you can find that will fit for any situation that you have because God has a purpose for his church in this day and in this age. So I'm going to let you go. And thank you so much for joining me today. And, um, you know, I, I hope we're going to see you somewhere soon in Cape Town. Remember, the 15th of October is at the Bron in Willowbridge, that's a prophetic morning with Rory and I, and then the 22nd of October, I'd like to see the ladies back for a ladies prophetic ministry morning in Connect in Deep River, Meadow Ridge, Deep River, and so please email, let us know you're going to join in, and I would love to see you there, I'm particularly excited about the 22nd because of the word, I've already been preparing for these meetings, I know what God wants to say, what he wants to do, and so we're going to have a fantastic time at both meetings. So if you're in Cape Town, join us. And ladies, register for the banquets January 2023. I'm already getting registrations. And we are going to have a fantastic weekend and feasting in the goodness of God that weekend. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I will see you again very soon. I appreciate you all. I really trust that you experience the blessing the over and above that you can even ask or think or request in your wildest dreams. That's my prayer for you for today. So have a fantastic Thursday, and I'll see you all again soon. Bye. Thanks for joining today's session. I hope you were equipped, empowered, and encouraged today by what you heard. Remember, you can find all the live video sessions that you may have missed on this page, on the Facebook page, Kathy Mole Ministries, or on YouTube, Kathy Mole on YouTube. You can also find all the other resources on kathymole.com.